And um, oh, uh, so the first thing I should talk about before we get to Newton's cradle is some of the vocabulary words about collisions because I never properly did it. So let me spend a couple minutes just uh, covering the vocabulary words about collisions. So it comes down to what we call types of collisions. And there isn't really much to it other than knowing the words that we use to um, say a particular thing. So let me call it uh, types of collisions. So there are three main types of collisions. Um, and there's really only two words that have to know. The two key words that you have to know are elastic and inelastic. But why am I saying there are three types? Um, with the inelastic, um, we actually, well, I, we introduced one more thing that we call completely inelastic. We briefly touched on this for the purpose of uh, doing, being able to do your lab on Tuesday. So um, I, I just want to tell you what the description of these are. And I guess the most important word here is the word elastic. Because if you, once you know what elastic means, then the rest kind of makes sense. Anybody here know what elastic means? Like, if you just heard the word elastic, what do you think of? Uh, like a rubber band. Rubber band, something that stretches, and you know, something that's bouncy, right? So when you have something that's bouncy, or golf ball, it's surprisingly elastic. In fact, if you cut it open, there's like rubber bands inside. That's what I hear. I haven't done it, but that's what I hear. So, um, so it's got elastic material in it, and with something that's elastic, this is what you see, that, you know, compare a golf ball with Something that's not going to be as loud. Uh, I'll do steel ball. So compare this golf ball with the steel ball. When I drop them, all right, they're all loud. Um, steel ball you know, goes to zero pretty quickly. Golf ball bounces a little bit more. So the, with the, what I want you to associate with the word elastic is conservation of energy, in particular conservation of kinetic energy. So um, that will be the definition that will hold for through almost all your classes, even in like particle physics, when people say elastic, they are talking about total kinetic energy being conserved. So, um, so that's what elastic means. So it means kinetic energy is conserved. And once somebody says that a collision is elastic, then you kind of leave it to the person who said the collision is elastic to um, establish how, how the collision is exactly going to be elastic. So you know, if I tell you the collision between these two cards is elastic, then you, you leave it up to me to exactly set up the situation that will make it elastic. So in this particular case, well, in the, yeah, it almost works without the track. In this particular case, the way it's made elastic is I, made, I put magnets here that repel each other. And they interact with each other in such a way that there's very little loss of energy. Um, so, so that's how I made it elastic. Or I could have done it with the springs. Or it could be uh, like a collision with this. It doesn't look like there's any springs there. But there's some mechanism there that makes it elastic. So that's why it's important to know this, what the, these words mean. Since once someone says elastic, they, kind of, they can now assume that you know that this means kinetic energy is conserved. Yep. All right, so, it, so what do you think in, inelastic means? Yeah, kinetic energy is not conserved. In fact, um, so I mean, inelastic means not elastic. So let me actually just write it down that way. So it means not elastic. So it means kinetic energy is not conserved, apparently. And you know, and when we say something is elastic, it's a bit of idealization. It's like me saying that this cart slides without friction. It's not 100% true, but I'm asking you to ignore friction. Even this golf ball, which I described as earlier as elastic, well, when you look at it too closely, you'll see that it's not really elastic. If it were truly elastic, it would bounce, 
and come back to this exact same point. But it doesn't. Uh, nothing that you have is ever perfectly elastic. But so when we say the word elastic, we are saying, OK, assume that. When we say something is inelastic, um, this is really all we are saying. When we say something is inelastic, we are saying, all right, no longer assume that kinetic energy is conserved. This uh, describes the vast majority of processes that you will see in real life. And what I'll tell you is that um, this is the least help helpful as far as problem solving goes. When I tell you something is an inelastic collision, essentially all I've told you is that energy is not conserved. So if you were hoping to use conservation of energy, I'm telling you, all right, you can't use conservation of energy. But I haven't given you any useful information beyond that. So if you want to, so you know, whenever a problem says that uh, something, some process is inelastic, I will have to give you additional pieces of information. Like in the case of this golf ball, I have to tell you, we do what speed, it's bouncing back. Otherwise, you have no way of figuring out. So you know, if, if I told you to say this is, if I told you to assume this is elastic, then you can assume whatever speed it's coming in with is the same speed it's going out. But if I tell you it's inelastic, then essentially there's a large range of possibilities. This golf ball, after dropping, it could actually get stuck and just remain there. That's the least energy it could have. Or after bouncing, it could come very close to elastic, but you know, 99% or something like that. So inelastic covers the huge range. So when I tell you something is some collision is inelastic, I essentially have to tell you additional information or you can solve the problem. It's uh, an underdefined problem. So which is why we talk of, we introduce this uh, additional category, completely inelastic. So what do you remember from what we covered about completely inelastic uh, on Tuesday? Like what do you look for to say that a process of comp, comp that a process is completely inelastic. Stephen? Not all kinetic energy is lost. So let me give you an example of a completely inelastic process. So this is an example of completely inelastic process. Let me take these two cards. OK. Um, so you know, I have arranged the magnets so that one way they repel, the other way they attract. So this collision that you will see now, this is a completely inelastic collision. Now, was all kinetic energy lost? No, right? It continued to move after collision. So now, actually, there is a law of nature that prevents me from getting rid of all of the kinetic energy. Any guesses what that law of nature might be? Conservation of what? Because you know, I'm saying that, so, OK, once again, total energy is conserved. But you know, in this collision, as much as possible, I'm going to get rid of mechanical energy, you know, turn you into thermal energy or whatever. But what I'm saying is that there is some other law that doesn't concern energy that actually says I can't do. I can't, you know, I can take this, take all of the kinetic energy away. I have to conserve. I have to keep some part of the kinetic energy. It's within something that we already covered. One of the laws of nature that we have covered, one of its implications is that in a collision like this, I can't get rid of all the kinetic energy. You could say Newton's third law, or you could say conservation of momentum. It means the same thing. Yeah. So because I have to conserve momentum, in this collision, you know, so when, when I was uh, holding onto this cart, there was external force, I could get rid of all the kinetic energy. But when I wasn't holding on to it, there's no external force. Momentum must be conserved. So I have to conserve enough of the kinetic energy to allow me to conserve momentum. Okay? Now, but Stephen, your intuition is correct. In that, so within the constraint, in completely inelastic collision, you lose as much energy as possible while still conserving momentum. So that's what happens in completely inelastic collision, but um, that won't be the usually the um, condition that's given to you. Uh, there's us the other condition that we usually use to specify completely inelastic collision. Sometimes, you know, never using the words completely inelastic collision, 
But by specifying a situation like that, you figure that, OK, this is completely inelastic collision. I know how to handle it. What's the one uh, condition you would look for? I mentioned this on Tuesday, like probably in the lab section, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and then they stick together. So it turns out that type of collision where two things stick together and move together is the configuration where I lose as much energy as possible. So if these two cars were coming towards each other, then they actually do reach zero kinetic energy. Because you know, I started out with a zero moment, net zero total momentum, so it didn't have to conserve any, like to conserve, this conserves the momentum. So, so, so that's what you look for with a completely inelastic collisions. So um, I might even use this as a definition of completely inelastic collision, that colliding objects, oops, objects stick together. And one of the properties that's useful to know is that in the completely inelastic collision, maximum possible, max possible kinetic energy is lost. In general, not all the kinetic energy, but maximum that, could, that you could lose while conserving momentum will be lost. Yeah. So these are the words we describe, these are the phrases we use to describe different types of collisions. And uh, both with the elastic and completely inelastic collision, often if I just to give you the initial condition, there will be enough information for you to solve the rest of the question on your own. Um, with a completely inelastic collision, the, um, the part that's giving you the necessary information is the fact that they stick together. So when they stick together, they have same, um, same velocity. And because after they stick together, they'll be moving together. And it turns out this condition is enough to give you all the necessary information to do the rest of the question. In fact, that's what you guys had in the ballistic pendulum problem. So you knew that the collision was uh, completely inelastic because the ball got stuck in the catcher. And I didn't have to tell you any other information for you to go from either the initial velocity to the final velocity, or from the final velocity to the initial velocity of the moving ball. 